Alright you guys, before we get into today's episode, I gotta talk to you once again about sponsorships. Look, if you're an avid listener of the podcast, thank you, but you'll know. And for those of you out there that are joining us for the first time, I, uh, I'm not having much luck with these sponsors. We've uh, had three different sponsors the episode so far, and each and every time that something has gone wrong that I've not been able to provide on the said deal. But today is different. I got a new copy, which means a new sponsorship. So let's get right into it. The internet's a crazy place right now. You're browsing the web, you need that security. There's some VPNs out there that you need to know and you need to trust. But there's which there's so many. Which one do you choose from? Don't worry about it. I've got you covered. That's where it comes in. Provide all the that you need to browse the internet safely. Don't need to worry ever again about so, use the code at checkout for percent off. Enjoy that. Browse safely. Enjoy the episode. All right, you guys, welcome back to another episode of Little Man Big Conversations. I am the Little Man, aka James, aka Flashman. It's great to be with you once again, and hey, Episode 3, last week, you guys tuned in, and I really do appreciate you guys tuning in and hearing that catch-up interview I had with Blaze. For those of you that missed it, Blaze and I were started wrestling 12 years ago, and I've known him 17 years. Crazy. But we caught up, but managed to interview him, and it was a great, great time. I really enjoyed catching up with him, getting some questions answered that I've been pondering and scratching my head for pretty much close to 11 years. So if you haven't checked that episode there, I really recommend it. It was a lot of fun. You guys have been super, super supportive thus far. You guys have been liking, sharing, commenting, subscribing, tweeting, hashtagging, downloading, streaming, sharing, putting it up in your stories, following it on different accounts. That's kind of cheating, but (laughs) hey, I appreciate the support nonetheless. This podcast is now available on Google, Apple Stitcher, Spotify, and Podbean. So there's a five different outlets now where you can get your podcast fix. You can tune into little old me every Wednesday. A new episode will come out. But hey, if you like, follow, subscribe to the podcast where the podcast episodes are hosted on those outlets that I listed. You will be notified every Wednesday at midnight. Yeah, midnight Tuesday, come Wednesday. You will be notified. You'll have that new episode sitting there waiting to go when you awake. Hell, you might already be awake. Well, if you are, I appreciate you listening to it then. But hey, that's how you get notified on it. Speaking of social media, this podcast now has a Facebook, a Twitter, and an Instagram. You can follow it on Facebook and Instagram at LMBC Podcast. And on Twitter, a little bit different, at LMBC underscore podcast. On those social media accounts, I share behind-the-scenes photos, sometimes videos at the moment, behind-the-scenes photos of situations or occurrences that have happened when I'm talking to my guests. For example, on last week's episode with Blaze, I shared the photos that we talked about during the debut match and the formation of the Rogues, where Blaze and I teamed up and Fury helped make the save at the end of the match. Those photos are now available on Instagram at LMBC Podcast and on Twitter at LMBC underscore podcast. Really recommend you guys check it out. Now, today's guest, we grew up together in high school. I've known this guy since 2005. As of this recording, that's 15 years ago. I met this guy. We've been friends. We've been brothers till the end since that day. He is the creator and chairman of the Villain Liftwear Company, formerly known as Brick City Villain. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Villain himself, Jason. Jason, how are you, man? Yeah, man, good, man. What's going on, bro? <laughs> man, it's awesome to hear with you. This is some crazy times, but it's awesome to hear from you, man. Now, before we get into this podcast, what do you prefer like, that I call you? I've always known you as Jace, but do you prefer – because you've got a different alias on social media, right? Yeah, 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 Mr. Villain, I guess. My, a lot of people know me by that, but yeah, Jason's fine, man. So what, what is what is Mr. Villain all about? What does that name come from? Where where did that begin? 
Yeah, well, Mr. Villain for me, villains kind of always represented the misfit, the rebel, you know. I mean, even even when we were growing up, it was always kind of like that, you know. So I was always kind of the kid who, I guess, wanted to do things my own way, you know. Didn't mm-hmm. want to follow the rules, wanted to kind of break the rules or not not so much break the rules in a in an illegal sense, but also break the rules in a way that did things on my own terms when it went against the grain. Okay, so it's more like a... Like you said, it's not a, a from a criminal aspect, but is it more like a societal aspect? Like you just want to, you don't want to follow the trend. You you want to do things on your own terms, making sure. your own path. Yeah, like an anti-hero kind of thing. I like that terminology. You told me when I when I, I remember when I asked you that uh, about Deadpool. You're like, so I'm like, so what is he? Is he is he, is he the bad guy? Like, is he, you're like, no, he's not not really, but kind of, but not really. He's the anti-hero. I'm like, what's an anti-hero? You're like. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of the anti-hero. For those that aren't aware, like we met about 2004 to 2005, and, and listeners to this podcast will know that I went to Hillcrest, which was a Christian college at the, at the time. Do you remember how our friendship came about? Because I remember a lot of memories of that school with you, man. But um, <laughs> do you remember how? Do you remember when we first sort of became chums? Yeah, shit, I remember that. Eh? Hillcrest, it was the Hillcrest days, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I remember being, uh, I, I think remember. it was through Mutual Friends, and there was just this really bright, blonde-haired dude that had a <laughs> very, very infectious laugh that uh. would would question a lot of things but would make jokes. And I think, I think you and I clicked when we realized our sporadic comedy nature – was mutual and we kind of had this tit for tat of who can make each other laugh harder. Like it was like, a, yeah. oh, this, this person's going to fall down the stairs. It's like, oh, I hope he doesn't break his, shatter his pelvis. And you're like, pelvis. Like it was just like <laughs> random terminologies and things like that, that, that for those that are, that are listening, we still to this day, something like 15 <laughs> years later, we'll still come up with strange, strange terms and phrases and things like that. But, I think that's where it first began for us, and then obviously we we hang, we hung out during high school. I, I grew up with you, and um, again, I'm very fortunate. Fifteen years later, to still have you be a part of my life. But for those that don't know, and even myself included, man, like how how did your journey begin? Because obviously, you didn't just sort of just stargate in at Hillcrest, and we became friends. You you've had your own journey to that high school and obviously a journey since then but but take us back to i guess the origins of not villain and not high school but the origins of yourself man like where where did it all begin for you mm. well yeah i was i was actually born in south africa so i mean a lot of people probably didn't know that but i was, oh, okay. I was actually i wasn't from australia so yeah so i i was i was a little bit i guess that kind of contributed to the anti-hero I guess thing because when when I first came here, I was, yeah, I was I was South African. I, I I came into this country as a bit of a foreigner, you know. I had the accent, I had all that shit, and because I wasn't very bright at school, I wasn't really the academic kind. I I was kind of a little bit of the outcast at school when I was really young. I mean, before I met you, I was I wasn't very popular. I was kind of just stuck to myself a little bit. I you know I was, I was teased her in my accent, and you know I was I was kind of almost bullied a little bit when I was when I was super young so pushing through that was kind of what grew me and I was expelled and told to leave from a few schools and then it ended up at Hillcrest that was my last kind of straw or my second last straw was to come there and that's kind of when I came into my own as an adult or not as an adult became a little bit more- <laughs> yeah, yeah very old high school student <laughs> yeah yeah I mean that was that was to me Hillcrest is my I guess the first school that I kind of started to meet people from Australia and all the other schools. I was a bit of a misfit, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how long did you stay in South Africa before moving to Australia? How long was that process? I was pretty young. I was probably like 10 years old or something when I came. Back. Okay. Did you move around yeah. South Africa at all? Or did you stay in the same sort of town or city? And then at, at 10, you... it was pretty rough, man. Like we, we had like, you know, guys with guns protecting our house and big electric fences, and yeah, it wasn't. It's not the. It's not all sunshine and roses like it is over here. So it's hugely different. It's huge for a kid to come from that, and I wasn't really happy to be here for a long time. It wasn't until I got 
a bit older until I started to enjoy this place. Um, was that a was that a big culture shock? I mean, I guess it's hard to have a culture shock at such a young age. But did you find being ten years old and quite literally traveling such a long way to a, a different world as as it would have felt like at ten years old? Was that a huge I guess, adjustment period for you or was it just like, oh, this is much better? Yeah, it was an adjustment period. Yeah, for sure. And and then, and that's where the whole, you know, the whole, I, I probably didn't fit in very well because I, I was from a different place and I didn't get along with Australian kids and they had a different sense of humor and they had a different way of doing things. And uh, yeah, South African kids are very different, man. It's, it's a very different kind of place, you know? So I had to, it took me a long time to adapt to that and but I think that kind of molded me as, as a kid, you know, not having those, those, those groups, I guess, shaped me and hardened me, I guess, as a little kid, because I had to do things differently and I had to find my own way. I didn't come from this place. So yeah, I, I, I think it was both a gift and a curse at the same time. It must have been so surreal because I moved from uh, New South Wales to Queensland at, at the beginning of high school. So I was sort of starting I guess my teenagehood to then come to Queensland and hit the reset button. But my first ever day of high school at Hillcrest was, you know, the orientation, uh, here's a canteen, here's a bubbler. It's like, yes, I know how a tap works, but Uh you go, we, they're like, okay, cool. We're all doing like a big grade nine group meeting. And I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. What is this normal? And they went, no, we've got grade nine camp tomorrow. So my second ever day of Queensland oh, cool. High School was grade nine camp where it was like, I know no one. And that for me was like, a, this is this is like that dream you have where you go to school. It's like you have a dream as a kid going to school and then you look down, you're not wearing any pants and everyone laughs at you or something. Like it was like that, but real. It was walking into a room and having something like 50 eyes of grade nine just stare at you and go, who the hell is this guy? So I felt that was such like a hard deep sea moment of, oh my God, how do I swim in this colossal sea of starting my teenagehood? But for you coming over at 10, and experiencing a different world, that must have felt like so, I guess, so surreal. Like, obviously, as you've just pointed out before, security guards and and fencing and things like that, that obviously must have been a nice change of pace, not having armed guards outside your house and things like that. But I'm sure getting used to the fact that this isn't home. How long was that period for you before you sort of felt like, okay, I can call Australia home now? Was it was it during high school or did you sort of adjust pretty quickly? No, it was quite a few years, man. To be honest, it probably was high, like in my high school years. Mm. It was a huge adjustment. And even though I wasn't – it was a young age, it was still quite a big adjustment period, hey. Just because it's such a different place, it's such a different vibe. You've gone from having like maids and staff and stuff there and – just everything's just okay. yes. Yeah, wait, wait, very, wait, wait. Very... You, 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 you had guards, you had fencing, and you had maids. Where were you living? <laughs> oh, everyone had maids. Yeah, everyone, everyone. Oh, yeah. Had it's just a very, very common. It's um, it's extremely cheap to have staff there. So you grew up with uh, wow. Yeah. Sounds like you have like a a square saved to you on like a monopoly board, man. This this sounds like a. <laughs> I mean, take out the guards and things like that. Yeah, that that yeah. definitely would have been different. And do you remember why you moved? Like, obviously, being young, you may not. But was it just need to get out of here? Was yeah, it just? It's, yes, South Africa is just a, it's a dangerous place, man. Like, so most most people actually do leave just because of the pure fact that it's just dangerous. Like, you can't some places in South Africa you can't even cross the road like without having like for like for instance, if they've got a, a like a red light, you just you just keep driving because it's just too dangerous to stop. Like we were we were followed home wow. by um, like by people with guns and we had to have police escorts follow us home at some points because we had like a car waiting outside our house and yeah my brother was you know his whole family was hijacked which is basically at gunpoint. Wait, what really. was who was hijacked? My my brother and and we had like even 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 our doors on our house had like burglar bars so burglar bars are basically like jail doors like jail fences on your windows so people can't break into your your kids rooms and stuff so it's pretty full on uh, yeah. like this this is this is kind of a revelation to me um yeah. do you do you have a do you have a brother yeah stepbrother yeah he's, he's actually living here in, in australia at the moment, believe it or not what okay so th- this isn't a work this isn't pre-planned i'm legitimately kind of <laughs> like what 
I never knew this. I always thought it was just just Jace. I always thought it was just you. You have a stepbrother? That's crazy, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and no, I've got a stepbrother and I've got three stepsisters as well. They're all in Africa. What the hell? Where is this family? Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, I know. This is nuts, man. Do you see them much? Like, know. are you still in contact with them? Yeah, well, my step, yeah, I, I actually am, yeah. So Greg's living with us now. And, yeah. That's in- that's insane, man. That That's, I'm learning stuff already. I, I feel like I'm that, that little image that you put on, like, social media. The more you know, that's that's quite awesome, man. I, I, I never knew that. So, okay, so you, you, you come over at 10 and you, you finish up the rest of, I guess, public school or grade school. And then we get to high school. That's, this is how you and I met, as we established before. But was this... Was Hillcrest your first high school? Yeah, Johan, a friend of mine actually said, like, man, you've got to come to Hillcrest, full of bloody hot chi- hot Christian chicks and it's like live bands playing in, like, freaking assembly. And I was like, this is a – that sounds like a pretty cool school, man. Like, because we used to hang out with a few chicks, like, on the weekends from Hillcrest. Like, these just – there was two chicks that used to go to Hillcrest and we used to hang out with them on the weekends. And I was like, this looks like a pretty cool school compared to my prudy – private school boring as hell people so i'm like i gotta get the fuck out of this school so well turns out i actually got asked to leave from my other school so i had to find a new school and then i ended up there man met you met you guys and it was all gravy (laughs) yeah man we we've for, for those of you guys listening jason and i have found ourselves in situations where upon going through the situation we either wake up the next day or after the situation has calmed down that same night, we look at each other and go, did, did that just happen? Because there have been many a times where we've gone to, I think the, the one thing that stands out for me is what, what, that when we were younger, we went down to a house party and this is about the time when all of us had dyed our hair black. We had experimented with piercings and screamo music because we felt that people yelling at us made us feel better. But we went to this house party and because we were sort of like all, I guess, socially depressed in the sense of we were happy with our kind of conglomerate and our groups and our extended sort of classmates that just happened to be at this party. But he kind of just felt it was two genres mixing. It was like alternate and metal mix, mixing with like James Blunt and surfy indie music. It was just like a really weird. Yeah, it was like pizza and broccoli. Both are great shouldn't be had together. And yeah, it was I, just this thing where it was like, this is just, it just felt strange. And I remember we had left this house party and we we're about not even a hundred meters down the road. And then I think there was about six of us and we all just kind of looked at each other and went, yeah, I'm getting that vibe that something's about to happen. Hey. And then I remember all of us turning around and someone had smashed a beer bottle on the floor and all six of us just legged it. And I think it took about half an hour and we all just went and we all just like spread out and we came back and we reunited. And I remember, I remember looking at you and going, did that just happen? And there's been so many times that we've experimented and had those situations in our lives. But I think for the people out there that want to know this, you've mentioned that obviously we've, 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 we've known each other for so long and we met each other during Hillcrest. We've had great, great memories, but you touched on it earlier. So you're at Hillcrest for, I want to say, was it about two or three years? And then, as you mentioned earlier, you were asked to leave. So take me through that process, man. So how, how long do you recall being at Hillcrest? And, and do you remember why you were asked to sort of say adios? It was pretty naughty, eh? I remember, like, kids, <laughs> we were, like, from, like, we used to sneak alcohol into school and get drunk in the toilets and then go and play sport. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Wow. Oh, you were that guy, huh? We used to get the Ribena poppers and we used to put put vodka in, in our Ribena poppers and then we used to just drink in the front of class and we'd just start bursting out laughing. It's the stupidest thing. And just little things <laughs> like that, just getting drunk at school. And yeah. And then I think from there, that was kind of the point in which we started like wagging days off school and, we used to like, instead of going like on sport days, we'd get drunk and play sport and absolutely fuck it up. And I think, remember, I remember me and, me and Zane and stuff, like we were the, we were the naughtiest kids. So we always kind of missed the choosing of sports. So we ended up having no sports left to choose. So we all chose volleyball. I don't know. Were you, yeah. were you playing volleyball with us? Or was it? Yeah, I was. I, I, uh, 
I looked at the sports list. I don't think I missed out because uh, I remember being told, hey, this is the sports you can do. And I remember looking at the list and I remember looking at the teacher and going, is this for real? Because one of the items on the <laughs> list, now you got to remember, this was like 2006, 2007. I'm being handed a sports list to, to be decided on what my sporting, quote unquote, high school future was going to entail. And the list, ladies and gentlemen, included badminton. <laughs> I don't want to be doing badminton as a 17-year-old kid because that because I thought at that point, man, that ain't cool. And I think the yeah. other one was like, I think the other one was basketball. And I remember saying, yeah, I'll be the ball <laughs> because I ain't dunk, I ain't dunking anything anytime soon. And then I think the other one was like rugby or Oztag or something. And I thought, oh, well, yeah, I'll go the lesser of evils here and I'll choose volleyball because – uh yeah volleyball's net was lower than a basketball net it definitely wasn't badminton and i'm not going to get tackled in half playing volleyball but yeah i remember doing volleyball with you guys do you remember why you were asked to leave um i don't know i guess they just the teachers just brought us in and they just kind of said like i don't know it was it was more of a i remember that they just started picking us off like flies and then it got to the point where it was me and zane in there and then I think they kind of said, like, look, you guys have got to go. And that was at the point where I said, this school is probably not for me. I mean, you know, it's it's just super weird. And I just kind of didn't get the vibe that I belonged there. And then that's when I went on to my last school, which was St. Michael's. And, mm -hmm. yeah, not much changed. I mean, I was definitely – I went from being, I guess, the naughty – I mean, I, I guess I went from being the outcast kid to kind of being more of the popular kid in that school just because it was kind of became a little bit cooler to be – you know, the naughty kids. So I kind of came into my own at, at, at St. Michael's and um, and decided, you know what, I'm, I'm going to leave school and create a clothing brand. Or I'm going to leave school and try the work thing out, get fired from a few jobs. And then I just thought, you know what, maybe it's maybe my destiny is to just create my own destiny, not work for anyone else or not be told what to do. You had that experience. And did you end up finishing high school or did that sort of – the, no, the rest out. did that. Oh, you no, dropped out. Okay. So, you, so what was it for you that you felt like, was it just a thing where it was like, Hey man, this, this being told what to do, this education thing, I'm just not yeah. enjoying it, not paying attention. Like what was it for you? Yeah, that's it, man. Just like, you just figured it out that it's just not for me. I mean, after four schools or however many schools it's been, you kind of figure out it's either for you or it's not. Yeah. 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 Cause yeah. I, cause I remember, I remember the week you left and um, this is this is real because this podcast is Little Man Big Conversations and you and I are having a big conversation right now. I remember you, I felt like – because, you know, teenagers are so dramatic at that stage. But I felt like in 2006, about to hit grade 12 and have this connection of, of friends that I could hang out with and people I could go and see on the weekends, things like that. Both you and Azza combined leaving pretty much in the same week played such a profound effect on my life because I felt like, oh, I've lost these guys that have pretty much helped shape who my identity is. And I and I was so it was so dramatic at that point again, being a teenager that I was like, I'll never see them again. And of course, fifteen years later I still see you pretty much as often as we can. But at that point I was like, I'm never gonna see this guy again. And, and it is just, like that. And, it, and there's, there's people I left in that school that I did feel like that, like just losing your friends at that age. I think it's, it's, it's huge. Eh? It definitely it, was pretty crushing. It's just one of the biggest like factors to figure into your life where you go like, okay, I'm, I've made it this far in high school. I've got my click. I've got my group. I've got my social security blanket as you would. I, I'm, I'm feeling good with these guys. And, uh, yeah, we're we're gonna throw water bombs. We, we're gonna we're gonna skull ribenas, and we're just really into ribenas, so that's all it is. And <laughs> and yeah, we're gonna cause mischief and mayhem, whatever wherever all of us went. But having that, it, it literally felt like oh, these guys have been arrested, socially arrested. I mean, I could yeah go to your house and stuff, but but it wasn't the same. We it wasn't like a hey, did you see what happened to this person on the basketball field? Oh no, wait, you're not here. Um, exactly. so yeah, it, it felt, it felt real weird, but I'm glad that when you left, you actually went with people that you knew. So you weren't sort of 
you know, hypothetically starting hitting the reset button again for almost the third time in, in a, in a high school. Um, so you, you, so you've dropped out of St. Michael's. Um, what happened then? So what did you, what at that point, do you remember being like, what do I do? Like, what was that process like? So you've gone, you've gone from Hillcrest to St. Michael's. You've thought this isn't for me. Was there something in your mind that said, Hey man, I would really like to try this, but I need to get the hell out of here first and here being high school. So was there something that went, Hey, I got to get out of high school because I really want to do X, Y, Z. It was that what was happening or was it just a case of, I, I don't want to do school anymore. Did you have a goal or were you just over school? I think when I was that age, man, I didn't have many goals. Like I was, I mean, I always knew that I always had bigger goals than a lot of other people when I was younger, but I didn't have anything in particular. I just knew that I knew that I wanted to be something great. And I knew that it was never going to be being told what to do. I, I knew there was something in line for me. I always knew I had a destiny. I've always had huge ambition, but it's at that point in my life, there wasn't anything in particular. It was just that I knew that this wasn't for me. It was only until later in life that I got to harness that energy and that that ambition and that I I'm, I can't do this. I'm going to be something else. It was only until like later in my life in which I was able to I, I guess harness that into a into something, which is why I did so well at it. But I guess at that age, it's it's hard to find your focus, and I had no focus. So it was just I'm just going to get out of here. I'm going to get out of here, and I'm going to go here, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this. But there was no real direction into what I was doing. It was just a like it, it was chaos. And then only, only later in my life was I able to organize that chaos. So you just were like, I got to get out of here. I want to try something different. Schooling is not working for me. So you've, you've yeah. left school. Did you then try and find part-time work or was there something playing in the back of your mind that went, Hey, um, I'm really yeah. into this or was, did you just well, try I and just I said, like, I knew that my passion was creativity. So I actually went and studied a bit of design and graphic design. And I actually got a job working for Unit, which was a well-known clothing company in Australia, one of the biggest in FMX at the time. And I actually got a lead design role there working as one of their main designers, which is interesting because it was a good, it was, it was, it was a good job. I was getting paid good money and, and I really enjoyed it. It was the first time I thought, you know what, like I can do this. I, I, I like, let me, you know, let me, let me design. But then Interesting enough, I I got to a point where I'm like, even this was like school. Like, what am I doing? I've got mm. a yeah, I've got a good job, but is this really what I want to do? Make money for someone else so that they get rich and they rock up to work in fancy cars and all these cool shit and just tell us what to do and then go back in his Lamborghini and fuck off and go and you know, I want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy yeah. that's fucking working for you and making you rich motherfucker. I want to be the guy who's <laughs> doing that. So I'm like, yeah, yeah fuck it. I, I, I left that. And then I went and said, you know what, even if I'm making nothing, I'd rather, even if I'm doing nothing and making a little bit of money, I'd rather work for myself and any means possible. I will not ever work for someone again, or I will not ever be told what to do because that's not for me. And I would rather make zero dollars. I'd rather rob a bank than work for someone else. And that's just, that's just, that's just me. And I'm not saying I'm a bank, but I would do anything I have to, to to kind of be my own boss. And I left that job for that sole reason that I want to be that guy. I want to okay. be that guy. I have a rainbow 80s inspired jumper that I bought from the unit factory outlet many, many years ago. And I saw it hanging on the wall and I went, this jacket is ridiculous. I have to have it. <laughs> and, and then if you it's yeah, a reversible yeah. one so so on the outside it's all color and rainbows but you can flip it inside out and inside out it's black with the gold unit writing so hey man maybe you designed this really zany jacket i bought i don't know so do you remember how long you were at unit before you went i'm out of here as well i can't even remember man to be honest like it wasn't long it wasn't that long to be honest okay okay so you were there for a little bit and you thought mm, yeah i'm I'm, 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 I'm definitely enjoying graphics. I like designing and creating things. I'm a creative person, but again, I'm not really doing it for myself. I'm kind of jumping through hoops yeah. and making things that someone else likes and I'm getting shit all paid from it. So you're out of there. 
what happened then? Did you is this around the time when you started putting the bricks together for your company, or was there something else happening in your life where you went, hey? I'm going to take time off and try this. Well, I always knew that I'm going to do my own thing. I guess what it was, was, um, I guess I did a few little things here and there. I did personal training and this, I did that. And I had a few different businesses in my, in, in mind. And I, I guess I, I sat down with a guy at the gym and it was a very, very huge moment for me when I met this guy, because a lot of people ask like, you know, how did you do it? When did you do it? How do you create something? How do you create a brand? Like, what made you do it? And it's always that light bulb moment of, can I do it? You know, a lot of a lot of people don't do things because they don't believe in themselves or they don't believe in the fact that, or they can't, I guess, they can't comprehend that their dream is possible. And I think a lot of the time I didn't do something because I didn't kind of comprehend or I wasn't able to harness my energy into any any particular idea. And it wasn't until I met this guy that he said, dude, those designs are sick what are you doing, man? Go for it. Like you should start that brand. That's dope. And I wasn't, I'm like, you know what? Fuck, what am I doing? Like, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to do something. I'm running around with my head chopped off what I'm going to do. And it wasn't until he said, go and do it. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go do it. And I, mm-hmm. and that's a, that's a light bulb moment for me because a lot of people don't do things because they stop themselves from doing it because they, they don't know how to do it. They don't know what to do. So they end up not doing anything. And it wasn't, it was just that little fire, that little kickstart that said, you should do it. That made me do it. And that was the very flame that brought everything into existence that is in today. So I thank that guy. His name's Andy. Yeah. And I still thank that guy till today for How did you start what was formerly known at that point as Brick City Villain, which is a liftware company which you have founded and created? And it's yeah. it's now called Villain, hence the name Mr. Villain. But back then it was called Brick City Villain. What was that process yeah. like? Was this was this after the gym um, conversation? Did you go home that night and went, hey, I'm going to call it this? Or was it a kind of a discovery point? Yeah, so I, I knew it was going to be clothing, but I'm like, you know, I sat down. I had a few ideas. It was, it was either Brick City or Villain. I had the two different names, and I was kind of tossing up between them both. And then we thought, what if we put them together and call it Brick City Villain? That kind of sounds mm. dope. Mm. And – we're like, yeah, that's dope. Let's do that. So we just put the names together and and Brick City Villain. And to me, Brick City represented like a bond held together like blood, like uh, a strong town or some sort of place that represents strength and power. Or 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 it could be the bond that held brothers together like bricks. Or uh, and then Villain to me represented myself. You know, the the misfit, the outcast, the antihero. And, um, mm. and, and then we made up some cool definition that villain was like the iron God, you know, the, the, the God of iron who was born in the town of brick city. Like it had some cool mythological kind of, he was the God of iron, the God of all that strong or, um, we had some pretty cool things that we actually created around that. Um, when I, when I, when I first started this and we even had this idea that BC, which brick city stands for before Christ. So we made like sick little, I, I mean, I, I don't know why I say I, but I made some pretty sick shit where I had like uh, old Greek gods with like everyone else is just following since BC to represent that we've been around since before Christ. And ever since then, everyone's just been following our brand kind of thing. So we put a, we put a hat on Gandhi and all this cool shit, like real controversial kind of <laughs> guerrilla marketing, it really, yeah. really the success of the brand being able to create something that stands out from the crowd, especially then, because a lot of people weren't really doing what we were doing then. So gym wear was just gym wear. It was boring. It was mundane. It was shit. It was just plain colors. And we came out there and just said, fuck you. This is all we're going to do. And it's totally cooler than everyone else's stuff. So you called it Brick City. Okay. So it's Brick City Villain. What was the process like from getting it, I guess, from, from paper to reality? What was that process like for you? You don't have to go into detail about how you got it done, but what I'm saying is how long was that process until you saw your first actual, you know, speaking of creativity, you, you've held yeah. your own creation in your hand. It was a printed shirt. It was the one of 100,000 or how many you sold now. How long was that process from an idea into your head to, to dabbling around on Photoshop to holding your first shirt? What was that process like? Shit, um, a few months, I guess. Uh, maybe not even. Really? Man. That short? probably not even like for me, when, when, I, when I put my mind to something, I just, I'm super impatient of a person. Like it, if I want something, I want it now, now I have to have it right now. So I just, I just full throttled ahead. 
we found our manufacturer, we found our printer, we printed a local guy in Australia. We literally just went, how do we get shirts? What do we do? Let's go there now. I designed the shirts literally that day on the computer. I just said, you know, here's the designs, day one, day two, day three, went to the printer and started getting them printed. It was a yeah, extremely quick process. So anyone who's saying it's a huge lengthy bullshit process, you are the one that's the problem because I'll do it in three days. It's it's not easy, but there is a way to get things done really, really quickly. So um, I think a lot of people who don't do things are often procrastinating because I'll show you, you can do it in half the time. That's insane, man. I had no idea it was that short of a time span, really. And was that yeah, super entirely – Yeah, 100%, man. It should be commended, man. That's very quick to, to launch. Did yeah. you have any assistant or was it just all you? So when, when I first started, Andy did help me out a little bit. And we also had a girl, I was actually dating at the time, so she was helping us. Yeah. She was the first one to help us pack all the clothing that we just got printed. So she'd, I remember I still, still got a video of her sitting in the corner of our like one bedroom apartment, like putting all the orders together and I guess ready for when we do start to take, taking orders and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. Like we started off at a pretty shitty little one bedroom apartment. And I used every little bit of savings that I had from the little odd jobs that I did. And, um, yeah. Yeah, put that towards just printing our first T-shirts. And yeah, and then my ex-girlfriend sitting there folding T-shirts in the corner, yelling at me, telling me to <laughs> shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> now, because you have designed this and because it's your creation, what was that feeling like, man? Because I've had that feeling when I've made like a video, like when I've edited something or I've done music videos, I've done short films, it's all finished. It's been shown on screen. People are reacting at the moment they should react. And I think, yeah, this is, it's that indescribable kind of sensation where you go, this is really good. And I kind of want to bottle this emotion and, and just uncork oh. it at, at, at the best of times and the worst of times. But it's a, it's a moment that you can never recreate again because it's the origins of something that you know is going to lead to something even better. But that was my experience with editing. But what was it like for you? Did you share a similar point of view where you went, I'm, I, I'm always going to remember holding my first my first company shirt or was it a case of, hey, man, this is just the beginning of something new? Like what was that like for you? Man, it was magical, dude. Like there's no yeah. words to explain that you've created this thing, that you've taken it from your mind, you've taken it and you've created this and it's become this physical thing. Like it's – it's a it's a, it's it's a milestone moment and it's 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 a life changing moment and it's something that I will spend the rest of my life chasing that chasing that moment because working for someone or doing your own like doing something like that you'll never get that like it's it's a completely different feeling when you've created that that's your destiny that's that is that thing that you've spent your whole life I guess your whole life has come into that light bulb aha moment that you're like, I've created this. This is my creation. Mm. And this is mm. very like, it's no one else. That's you. You know what I mean? That's, 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 that's your thing. You've done that on your own. And that's, yeah, it's huge. It's a huge, huge, huge moment. And I'll, um, I think those moments are what I live for, man. Those, those moments of creation for sure. I'm glad you had that man. So, okay. You've had the moment of revealing your first shirt. You, you've held it in your hands do you remember how long it was from when it went from packing the boxes in your uh, in your place that you were at to getting them in stores? Was was that a hard process? Was that longer than starting the brand, or was that quicker than starting the brand? Oh, for sure. That's 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 definitely the process. So I guess the for, from the idea to creating the very first T-shirt, I mean that was that was done as fast as I could possibly do it, and then. The next stage is now how do we now take this brand and create enough hype around this to make it something that people who don't know about this, what are they going to buy this for? Like, why are they now going to join this, 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 this cult, this community? So we created something that was so, I guess, a feeling. We created a feeling before a brand. It was something that people had to be a part of. How do you create something that people need to be a part of? And I think we did that really well with it, with our marketing. Like, fuck average is one of our things or, you know, cause everyone else is just following. And we created this, this brand that was so different to every other activewear brand that we just stood out from the rest. And it just seemed to catch on with a certain people, amount of cool people. We connected, I guess, on the first level of influencer marketing was we met people that were just the coolest kids in the gym. And we just like, fuck, let's give all the coolest kids in the gym, the brand. 
and they started wearing it. And then it just started to catch on and people were like, this is cool. Like all the cool kids are wearing it. I'm going to wear it. And these guys don't give a fuck if we wear the brand or not. Cause it's like a, we don't give a shit attitude. Like we're the outcasts. We're the any heroes. You want to be part of us. You can be part of us. If you don't want to fuck off. Like that was our attitude. It wasn't pleased by my stuff. It was, if you kind of fit our criteria, you can wear our stuff. We didn't, yeah. we never ever yeah. begged for people to wear our stuff. We never, we never forced anyone to wear our stuff. We just created a vibe that was cool enough that people wanted to buy our stuff. So I think mm-hmm. in any marketing, if I was to give any marketing advice, it would be create something that people want to be a part of. Don't beg into people's lives. Like be the, be the thing that stands on your own feet that is cool. And then people will want to buy it and be a part of it as opposed to, I guess, how can I just get this item so people will buy it? Or what can I do? What do people want? We said, this is our vibe. This is our tribe. So that was, so that was definitely the key to, I would say, our success and how we separated ourselves from the market and shone through, for sure. Man, you should be commended, man, because that's uh, it takes a lot of drive and initiative to approach a gym of all places. It's not like you're going into – you know, like a farmer's market with some melons being like, I've got these for you, sir. Like you can't really just put yeah, it up totally, a store yeah. and be like, fresh melons from the garden it is. Like you you have to I, essentially scratch and claw and and not so much beg but prove to retail stores. I mean, um, uh, for those that are listening out there, Jason has is selling the villain wear online through the online store, which arguably a lot of fashions, uh, especially in, in this in this societal situation that we've all found ourselves to be in is thriving but having oh. physical copies and and supply and demand is is always is always a challenge it's crazy to to think that the, the kid that was sculling ribena is now oh. telling other people to wear my shirt because yeah. i remember and I, I don't think i've ever told you the story but i i went to a supplement store Shortly around the time when Rick City Villain was just coming up through the ranks, and one of the supplement store I went to had featured one of your posters, and um, oh yeah, okay. and it was like it was the slogan that you had. It was F Average and Brick City Villain and available now and all things like that. And I remember saying to the supplement guy, "Hey, that's one of my mates," and he went, "What?" And I pointed the poster and I said, "Yeah, that's one of my mates in the poster. That company was actually started with one of my best mates in high school." And I was given this look of, yeah, whatever, mate. He's, he's everyone's best mate in high school. And I'm like, damn it. Uh-huh. <laughs> it just didn't, believe, just didn't believe me. But I knew at that point, man, that that's going to be something. And he's got the drive to make it into something. And I'm, uh, I'm very proud of you, man, because for someone that went through the initial struggles of coming up through school and not really giving a care academically to, to a certain extent, but not really fitting that mold and being like, yeah, this isn't working for me to to start a business, to take it from screen to reality, and then now be one of the, uh, the one of the figureheads in liftware companies around the world, man. I mean, congratulations, dude. That's that's such an amazing feat. Cheers, bro. And yeah, that's no, it. It's... Uh, <laughs> good night, everybody. Awesome. Shortly, <laughs> shortly thereafter, you've you've done the villain brand. It's out there. You begin to start traveling the world. Did you travel and move for business or was this sort of like a leisure thing that happened to coincide with business? Yeah, leisure. For, for, for me, like lifestyle has always been my number one priority. Like I, uh, my, my motto is build your, like create a lifestyle and let your business work for your lifestyle. Don't, I don't want to work for money. I wanted to create my lifestyle and make everything work for that. I would rather yeah. have, have things work for me as opposed for me working for it. So that yeah. was that lifestyle was definitely the priority of that. that okay. Move. Well, Jace, we're getting to the point now where we've we've learned how you got here. We've shared high school memories. We've learned how you started villain, but now we're getting to the part of the podcast where I like to call it a bit of a deep dive. And don't worry, I'm not going to go through your social media. I'm not going to bring up any old tweets or anything like that. Okay. But I'm going to ask you a series of questions here, man, and we're going to get to really know the insight and how that that creative brain of yours works. So are you ready for these deep dives? Mm-hmm. Straight off the bat, what would you do if you weren't doing your current job? So what would you be doing if you didn't have villain? What would I be doing if I didn't have villain? Um, mm-hmm. Probably sitting on a beach doing something else. Fuck, I don't know. 
What would I be doing if I didn't <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't do villain? What would I be doing? Yeah. I don't know. My other fascination is psychology. So I guess I, I, I did study that for a long time and I think that probably would have helped villain. I guess psychology, man, like something in the in the in the in the lines of helping other people. And man, honestly, I, I love fashion. And if I didn't have villain, it would probably be another brand, to be honest. Or anything in the anything creative, I would say I would be in creatively. Yeah, okay. design, design of any sort, man, to be honest. What was a turning point in your life and how did it affect you? So my biggest turning point when I started this and this brand took off was when I left the Gold Coast. Okay. That was my, that was my turning point. I was at a point in my life where I was doing nothing. I was partying. I was, I was just a bit of a shit kid, you know, like – after I left unit, I did, I did do a few jobs here and there, but overall I was kind of stuck in a bit of a bad crowd. Um, you know, the kids kind of, the people I was hanging around with probably weren't the right people. They were definitely not the people that I would aspire to be. And it, I, I hit this point in my life where I'm like, you know what, if anything's going to happen and if my life's going to change, I, I just had this overwhelming reason to say, I've got to get a fuck out of here and start off and start fresh. And yeah, I moved to Melbourne and and that was the point in where my business just blew up and my whole life changed. I, I found a new circle and it's, I, I, I guess if you're stuck in a rut, just leave that rut. And mm-hmm. I just evacuated. Probably the best thing I've ever done in my life was leave Gold Coast. Well, I mean, you got to come out of your comfort zone one way or another, man. And I yeah. always thrive by the advice that, um, you know this, but for the people out there that are, that are listening may not know this, is I have two books in my life that I always go to for advice. One is the TV guide. No, um, <laughs> one is, one is a book called this is going to hurt. And it's by Nikki six, the basis from Motley Crue. He has a, he's played a yeah, vital no. role in my life. And he speaks about renegotiating your life where no one is essentially putting a gun to your head, telling you, you have to be this. You, um, if you, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, then just renegotiate your life. So it, it kind of plays truth um, that you said just then, man, I'm I'm feeling like I'm in a rut here. I need to get out of here and yeah. taking that dive, moving out of your comfort zone. That was you renegotiating. That was you starting to sort of come into your own as not only uh, an adult, but as a, as a business owner. Yeah, 100%. Best thing I've ever done. You know, it's, it's, it's the pressure that makes you expand. So just put yourself in a position where you have to expand, where there's no choice. You go into a place where you don't know anyone. It's a new place. It's a fresh place. You have no choice but to expand. Yeah, so for me, that was huge. So speaking of huge, this is a question that I know that you may take an extended amount of time answering because it is a huge question for someone like yourself in the position that you're in. How would you define success? How would I define success? Yeah. Freedom, hundred percent freedom. Um, I guess that's the only way that I could describe my my ultimate goal isn't money. It's how free are you? Like I could be working, you know, seventy hours a week and getting paid millions of dollars, but am I really free? So for me, the the ultimate freedom is the ultimate version of success. Like if you have nothing tying you down, you can do what you want. You have you have the ability to be free. You have the ability to give back. You have the ability to to, to teach people, to shine, to, to, to spread what you've created, to, to do what you want on your own terms, to not be bound by certain things or not have anything holding you to a certain regime. You have your own freedom to, to do it. So for me, freedom is the ultimate success is how free are you? And money definitely comes into that because money does buy freedom. But I think for me is the, the most happiest people in the world are the people who are the most free. Freedom is success for me for sure. That's exactly what I thought something similar to what you've been through would be answering yeah. about freedom, 100%. Yeah. So you've been given advice in the past um, from Andy at the gym, starting Brick City Villain. But for you now, looking back on everything that you've accomplished thus far, and I'm, and I'm undoubtedly sure there'll be much more to come, but thus far, looking back, what is the best advice you have ever received? Best advice I ever received? Mm-hmm. Fuck, that's a good one. 
And I know what it is. I just kind of like, <laughs> it's on the top of my head and it's a really freaking good one. To become what you want to be, which means to, okay, so did the millionaire or did the free person or whatever you want to call, did they become free when they got the freedom or when they decided that they were going to be free? Hmm. Did the millionaire become the millionaire when he got the million dollars or when he decided to get the million dollars? Like, or when he decided that that's what he was going to get. So I think the yeah. moment that I, that clicked with me, I decided that this is going to be my future. I'm going to be free. I'm going to be on my own terms. The second I decided that is when it became into creation and, and I walked the walk that was necessary to make that happen until I believed that that was possible. It wouldn't have happened. So being able to, I guess, accept your fate, accept your destiny is, are you able to accept your destiny? And, and the advice is find a way to visualize and accept your destiny and it'll, and it'll come every single time because yeah, you've, you've, you've accepted that. And when I've started to see, just accept that I'm going to be free and this is going to be my future, then things have just effortlessly come into my life. So for me, that's probably one of the greatest things that I've ever, I guess, adopted. I'm glad that the advice actually rings true to you because there's so many tales of advice that people go, oh, you know, just try this. It worked for me. And yeah, exactly. people try that and they go, yeah, but you're in a different position in my life than what I'm at. And that advice works for you in your current state, but not for me. But it's awesome to hear that that advice that was given to you lit a fire, poured gasoline on that fire and just absolutely ignited you into creating what you now can – successfully lean back and go, yeah, this is all mine. Um, so yeah, profound advice. All right. This is the part of the podcast now, which I like to call the Lipton six. This is in tribute of James Lipton, who sadly we lost earlier this year in March, 2020. He was an American writer, lyricist, actor, and the Dean of the actors studio drama school at Pace university in New York city, where he hosted and ran his TV show inside the actor's studio from 1994 2018. So in honor and tribute of him, I'm going to ask you his famous six questions that he would ask all his guests before wrapping up his interview. So are you ready for the Lipton Six? Uh -huh. Okay. So Jace, what is your favorite word? Villain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Villain, anti-hero, anti villain, I don't know, anything that represents that kind of thing, I guess. What turns you on? What turns me on? Yeah. A great ass. <laughs> fair. Fair <laughs> enough. What, uh, <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Uh, um, that one. <laughs> yeah. Let's go that one. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your favorite curse word? Fuck. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? So if someone said to you, hey, man, come and do this right now. What other, what other profession other than what you're doing right now would you like to try? Maybe uh, you know, a photographer. Let's call it a photographer. I would love to f photograph the female form. I think it's quite an art form. Male form, not so much. Okay. So no selfies. All right. No Jace, selfies. Jace, if, he if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Welcome to heaven. Here's everything you ever wanted. And I'll just be like, hang on, I've already got that on earth, so I'll see you later. I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> All right. All right, man, we've, we've, we've taken a deep dive. We've gone through the business history. We've gone through our history. We've gone through your personal history back home in South Africa. We're coming to the... We're coming to the final stretch now, man. We're gonna we're gonna pump it out. We're gonna hit into overdrive. We're gonna hit that NOS. We're gonna start going straight into the final four. So, Jace, was there ever a point where you thought, "Hey, this isn't gonna work"? Yes. I mean, I've always doubt. I've always had did like there's, there's there's always been moments of when you're like, "Fuck, is this gonna work?" I'm gonna doubt it, and I've doubted it. And you know what, like. Yeah, you you have doubt, but it's 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 the ability to overcome that that really, yeah, that that really makes a difference. So yeah, and I'm always having to overcome certain things and make my mind stronger and believe in things. 
because if I did believe in it, I'd already have it. So, yeah, there's always a level of doubt for sure. Have you ever stopped and thought, how the hell did I get here? Um, yeah, I mean, when I've had, I, I guess when I, yeah, when I, when, when my brand really did become kind of like bigger than I've ever expected, I, I, I did have that moment when I was like, wow, how the fuck did I get here? So I guess that next moment will be even better, more exciting. So I'm looking forward to that moment. Speaking of moments, currently, what is your proudest moment or achievement? My proudest moment or achievement? Being able to live overseas, not having to touch any books, not having to do anything, being completely free, living in a beautiful villa, having unlimited freedom and just being able to look at sunsets every night and just say, this is my life. Like I created this and I'm not answering to anyone and I've done it on my own. And I think that's, that's something that everyone should strive for because I can tell you now, it's a, it's a beautiful feeling to be free. And I think, everyone should chase freedom because there's nothing more amazing in the world than being completely free. I'd wish that upon everyone, man. The, the sense of freedom is something that I think we all wish for in this day and age, but I'm proud that you achieved it, man. And speaking of age, at this now age... I'm not free. <laughs> I've gone yeah. from being free locked in my house and I can't... I'm going to get some killer virus. I've gone from one extreme to the other, which is good. It's balance, I guess. Hey, it's going to make me appreciate it out. <laughs> hey man at least you can see sunsets every night right yeah exactly <laughs> I can't not see it I have to see it yeah. <laughs> different when you now, see it yeah. now back when you were struggling through the books and trying to find yourself yeah. and go into the ranks and not enjoying yeah. the school did you ever think at this age you're at now did you ever stop and think that this is where you'd be you know what? I probably always had a little bit of an inkling that I am going to be free, but did I fully believe it or not? I don't know. I, yeah, I don't even remember. I don't know how to answer that because I think half are 50 50. Yeah, I believed it, but did I fully believe it? Probably not. So, yeah, I guess that's like a half half kind of thing. Well, man, I think we've come to know you i've i've definitely learned things about you that i didn't know and i've known you for quite some time so this has been real eye-opening for me thank you for giving me your time because i know running this business is so volatile at, at, at the best of times things can switch and change at an instant so i really appreciate you being so raw and authentic and for coming on this podcast man where can people find you on social media yeah so my personal instagram is at Mr. Dot V I L L I N, Mr. Villain. And my brand is at V I L L I N. So, yeah, check me out. And the website and to buy some merch? We do. Uh, www.villain.com.au. All right, Jason. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast, man. It really means the world to me to have you on here. I've known you for close to 15 years now. I went through school with you. You're an entrepreneur now. Everyone out there should get a piece of this villain merchandise. I love you, man. I wish you all the best. Thank you so much again, and I hope to see you real soon. Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. Talk to you guys soon. All right, so there we go. Episode four is now in the books. Once again, thank you all out there for following, subscribing, downloading, tweeting, hashtagging, streaming, putting it up in your stories, doing what you have to do to follow the Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter of Little Man Big Conversations. We'll be back next Wednesday with another new guest. You're going to want to check into that guest. I can guarantee you it's not going to be something out of the norm. Once again, thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next Wednesday.